Good afternoon and welcome to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. My name is Morris Goldstein. Uh, I have been a senior fellow at PIIE since 1994 and I will be standing in for Adam Posen as host for today's event. We are in for a treat. Our speaker is Professor George Akerlof of Georgetown University. George is going to interest, introduce his new book, co-authored with his friend and fellow Nobel laureate Robert Schiller of Yale University called Fishing for Fools. George doesn't really need an introduction, but I will provide a very short one nevertheless. He is university professor at Georgetown, which he joined in November 2014. Before that, he was the Koshland Professor of Economics at the University of California at Berkeley, where he has taught since 1966. In 2006, he was president of the American Economics Association, and in 2001, he received the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on asymmetric information and its effect on economic behavior. The game plan is as follows. George will speak for about 40 minutes. We will then turn to our distinguished audience for questions. And after the Q&A, there will be a book signing for those of you who wish, wish to purchase Fishing for Fools. So without further ado, George, tell us about your new book. Thank you. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, so we have this new book. It's called Fishing for Fools. And um, it has a very good cover, which is drawn by Ed Corrin, who is the New Yorker cartoonist. So. Um, the official publication date is tomorrow, so I guess today's the 21st and the 22nd is supposed to be the day. Um, it's meant to be a popular book, but actually it's more than a popular book because it's a, it is actually a book that does question lots of the foundations of economics. There are two reasons why we made it into something that uh, we think is, we hope is popular. The first is that we are influenced, we think, more than we think by popular books. And the public and economists have too great an acceptance, we think. This is our major message of the view that whatever markets do is right. So that's the major question that we address. Of course, all of us would take into account the standard externalities and income distribution. But that does not exhaust the reasons why competitive uh, markets yield bad outcomes. So this book is ex going to explore the following notion, the notion that markets deceive us and manipulate us. So we have a name for this. We call this fishing for fools. Now, all economists know this. Everybody here in this room knows this. But that leads to the second very general motivation. The rule of what can and cannot be published in economics leaves holes. There's some perfectly valid and important things to say, but there's no way to say them that would be acceptable in any economic journal. For example, quite a few economists, maybe quite a few in this room, thought that financial derivatives would lead to the current crisis. But economists could not figure out, we could not figure out a way to express these views in the form of a paper. So I believe that fishing for fools is one of those holes in economics. Because we all know it, because everybody in this room knows it, uh, it cannot be published. But because it cannot be published in journal form, then it gets ignored. And because it was ignored, we had the financial crisis. And the financial crisis is the central event in the economic history of our times. But then. The book also has a subtext. So there's an important subtext which gradually becomes increasingly important as the book proceeds. And I'll get to that at the very end. So I'm going to come to that at the very end. But, and then, so that's a reason for staying to the end and seeing what, uh, what there is. And I think that's also a reading, reason for reading the book as a, beyond um, the talk, because as a crescendo, this subtext becomes much more important. And I think it's actually one of the fundamental things that's missing to, to almost all economic analysis as we know it. Okay, 
So with these prefatory notes, um, okay, so with those prefatory notes, uh, let me begin. Uh, the book is based on conversations with Danny Kahneman some 25 years ago. In a conversation then, he told me that the basis for psychology was that humans are machines, and they are machines that are prone to error. The job of the psychologist is to ferret out that error. In contrast, he said, the fundamental notion of economics is equilibrium. That equilibrium means that if there is a profit left on the table, someone will take that opportunity for profit. Now, all of us know that, and we see it every time we go to the supermarket. There, people sequentially line up, uh, and they ch choose what they think is the shortest line. And in equilibrium, then, the lines are almost the same length. So then the question is how to put Danny's uh, insight into economics. So Danny's insight says that free markets will not just provide what we really want. That is only the case if those human machines are making the right choices. But free markets will also provide us with the wrong choices, and they will do so just as long as there's a profit to be made. So the principle that we're going to explore means that if we have some weakness, if we have some weakness or other in the equilibrium, that weakness will be taken up. It will be taken up as long as there's a profit to be made. So what does that mean? That means that among all those business persons figuratively arriving at the checkout counter, looking around and deciding where to spend their investment dollars, some will look to see if there are unusual profits from our weaknesses. If they see such an opportunity for profits, that will be, again, figuratively, the checkout lane that they choose. So as a result, economists will have an equilibrium. They will have a fishing equilibrium. That's an equilibrium in which every chance for profit, more than the ordinary, will be taken up. And that will include our willingness to make the wrong choices. So let me give you three examples. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see, where are we? Today's observation. I'm going to get three examples. Okay, the first example is Cinnabon. Okay. So back in 1985, father and son, Rich and Greg Coleman of Seattle, founded Cinnabon Inc., and they had a marketing strategy. They would open up outlets that baked the world's best cinnamon roll. Now, Cinnabon has 880 calories, which is a lot, and they have a nice motto, life needs frosting, and you'll see that frosting there, okay? So the Comans took a great deal of effort to develop their marketing strategy, especially cinnamon, which they chose carefully, is said to attract humans by its smell, just the way pheromones uh, attract moss. So most of us probably take it for granted. We take it for granted that there just happens to be such an outlet right there uh, where we're waiting for our delayed flight or at the mall. All those outlets and all that cinnamon, which undermines our diets, they're a natural result of a free market equilibrium. So just go to Dulles Airport, which is out that way, or go to National Airport, which is over there, and you're going to find that there is such a, uh, an outlet. OK, I'll give you a second example, uh, health clubs. Uh, so Stefano Delavigna and Ulrich Malmendie report from their survey of 7,500 Boston health club users that when the customers first went to the health club, they signed into contracts for which they overpaid. Okay. So they would typically be offered three different contracts. Uh, they could pay by the visit. They could pay by credit card with automatic monthly rollover, unless canceled, or they could take out an annual contract. So most customers chose the monthly contract. But 80% of them would have paid less by the visit. Furthermore, the losses from this wrong choice were non-trivial, that was $600 per year out of average payments of $1,400. And 
And then, to have add insult to injury, a very large number of the clubs put roadblocks in the way of canceling the contract, such as requiring a notarized letter. Now, of course, the existence of those contracts was no coincidence. They're there. They're there for a simple reason, because there was a chance to make a profit. Okay? So now let me give you a third example. Okay, and that third example comes from Bob. Now, Bob is an utter genius, and only Bob could have thought of this. And uh, it always makes me laugh whenever I think about it. Um, so it's a metaphor. And um, Keith Chen, Venkat Lakshmi Narayanan, and Laurie Santos uh, taught capuchin monkeys how to use money to trade. Now, the monkeys developed an appreciation of price, and they saved, and they either did other uh, transactions, some of them less savory. But let's go beyond those experiments. Let's do a thought experiment. So here's Bob's thought experiment. Suppose we open the monkeys up to trading with humans quite generally. We would give a large population of capuchins substantial incomes, and let them be customers of for-profit businesses run by humans without regulatory safeguards. Well, you can easily imagine that the free market system, with its taste for profits, would supply whatever the monkeys chose to buy. So we'd expect an economic equilibrium with concoctions appealing to strange capuchin tastes. But amid this monkey cornucopia, their choices would be very different from what makes them happy. So we know from Chen, Lakshmi Narayanan, and Santos that they love sweet fruit roll-up tacos with marshmallow fluff. Well, capuchins have limited ability to resist temptations, so we have every expectation that they would become anxious, malnourished, exhausted, addicted, quarrelsome, and sickened. Okay. So now we come to the point of this thought experiment. We shall see what it has to say about humans. So our view of the monkeys has, has analyzed their behavior as if they have two types of what economists call tastes. The first type of tastes are what the capuchins would exercise if they made the decisions that are good for them. The second type of taste, their fruit roll-up tastes, are those they actually exercise. So humans are no doubt smarter than monkeys, but we can view our behavior in the same terms. We can imagine us humans, like the capuchins, as also having two different types of tastes. So the first type of taste describes what's really good for us. But as in the case of the capuchins, that's an all, not always the basis for all of our decisions. The second concept of taste is the taste that determine how we really make our choices. And those choices may not, in fact, always be good for us. So the distinction between the two types of tastes and the example of the capuchins give us an image. We can think about our economy as if we all have monkeys on our shoulders when we go shopping or when we make economic decisions. And those monkeys there on our shoulders are in the form of the weaknesses that have been exploited by marketers for ages. Because of those weaknesses, many of our choices differ from what we really want. All alternatives, they, they differ from what's good for us. So we're not generally aware of that monkey on our shoulder. So in the absence of some curbs on markets, we reach an, equal, an economic equilibrium where the monkeys on the shoulder are substantially calling the shots. So let me now make a, uh, a note, um, and that is, we think, oh yeah, the capuchins, we're, the capuchins, we're, we're, humans are so much smarter than the capuchins. But you have, to free, you have to remember something, the capuchins can't read. So all of those advertisements that are, would be advertising us and are tricking us, they would mean nothing to the capuchins. The capuchins just go and they take their marshmallow fluffs. We, in fact, we have a whole, whole array of ways in which, we, in which people can get to us where they can, they'd have no effect whatsoever on the capuchins. <laughs> OK, so where does this fit into economics? So this really fits into something that's actually fairly important in economics. So let's go into this. I will describe this in more detail. So back in Adam Smith, as we all know, back in 76, 1776, wrote the following. 
that with free markets, as if by an invisible hand, each person pursuing his own interest also promotes the general good. Now, there's a modern rendition of this statement, and that is that competitive free market equilibrium is Pareto optimal. So what does that mean? That means that once such an economy is in equilibrium, it's impossible to improve the economic welfare of everyone. So any interference would make someone worse off. The theory of a course recognized some factors that might blemish such an equilibrium of competitive free markets, such as externalities in bad distributions of income. But with these qualifications, the result is believed to be true. But then, with completely free markets, there's not only freedom to choose, but then there's also freedom to fish. Now, it'll still be true. Now, this is the thing. The theorem still goes through. It'll still be true, following Pareto, that the equilibrium will be optimal. But, will it, but it will be an equilibrium that's an optimal, not in terms of what we really want. It will be an equilibrium that's optimal instead of terms of our monkey-on-our-shoulder tastes. And that, for the monkeys and for ourselves, would lead to manifold problems. So standard economics has ignored this obvious difference because most economists have thought that, for the most part, people do know what they want. That means that there's nothing much to be gained from examining the differences between what we really want and what those monkeys on our shoulders are instead telling us. But that ignores something. That ignores the field of psychology. Because the whole field of psychology is, or at least most of it, is about the effects of those monkeys on our shoulders. It also ignores the fact that the competitive equilibrium will also involve people generating information that will lead us astray insofar as it is legal and insofar as there's a profit to be made by it. So in terms of our book, Markets Enable Fishing for Fools. OK. So let me give a more precise definition of fishing for our purpose. So fish is a recent word. It's computerese. And uh, free markets open us up to those who seek to influence to do what they want, but that's not necessarily good for ourselves. They allow us, in other words, to be fished. And so we live in a world, so this is particularly appropriate for the P Peterson Institute, we live in a world where some five billion adults can fish us for being a fool. So we intentionally opened us, ourselves up to such exploitation because of the uh, obvious advantages, but then we must also think about the other side of the bar. So what is a fool with a PH? A fool is simply one, someone who is successfully fished. And our view of a fool is everybody's a fool. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our weaknesses someplace. And so a fool is in some sense an intelligent person. A fool is in some sense just somebody who's human. OK. So the onus is now on us. The onus is on Bob and myself in the book to indicate that in real life, this equilibrium does affect our lives. So, you know, I've, I, I must confess, before I wrote this book, I always thought pretty much uh, the things that we, the, all the decisions that we made, we, we made the right decisions, pretty much, subject to all kinds of problems of information and that. But actually, having written this book, I've actually changed my mind. Now, of course, I've spent five years writing this book, and Bob has spent five years, and we've had research assistants. But um, the fact is, I seriously believe that this is a major problem, and I'm going to give you four reasons why. So there are four areas. Um, so there are four areas of what we call nobody could possibly want. And I'm going to give you those four areas. Okay. The first is personal financial insecurity. Fundamental fact of economic life has never made it into the economics textbooks. Most adults, even in rich countries, go to bed at night worried about how to pay the bills. Economists think that it's easy for people to spend according to budget, but we shall see later that it isn't. Now, no one wants to go to bed at night worried about the bills, but most people do. Area two of nobody could possibly want is financial and macroeconomic instability. 
So fishing for fools in financial markets is the leading cause of the financial crises that lead to the deepest recessions. So in the 1920s, it was Swedish matches with the Ivar Kruger of Kruger and Tall. In the 1990s, it was the dot coms. And in the 2000s, it was subprime mortgages with Angelo Mazzillo of Countrywide and his like. So every time, it is different. The stories are different. The entrepreneurs are different. And their offerings are different. But also, every time, it is the same. There are the fishermen and there are the fools. And when the build-up stock of undiscovered fishes, named the bezel by John Kenneth Galbraith, gets discovered, asset prices crash. So in the last crisis, the investment managers who had purchased the packages with the bad mortgages in the build-up to the crash could not have possibly wanted them. And so we shall return later to that in the talk. So area three of nobody could possibly want is ill health. Okay. Here we discuss how the pharmaceuticals do their fishing and how the food industry with a pH fills us with sugar, salt, and fat. In its five-year uh, career, just to give you one example, Vioxx is estimated to have caused 26,000 to 56,000 cardiovascular deaths in the United States alone. Failure to notify women of suspicions about Premarin a home replacement is estimated to have caused some 94,000 cases of breast cancer. So nobody wants bad medicine. Um, about 69% of American adults are overweight, and more than half of them, 35%, are furthermore obese. Yet no one wants to be obese. And then there is tobacco. No one wants lung cancer. And then there is alcohol. No one wants to be an alcoholic. OK, so bad government. Just as free markets work at least tolerably well under ideal conditions, so does democracy, politics is vulnerable to the simplest fish, whereby politicians silently gather money from the interest and use that money just to show that they're just one of the folks. So our latest ch later chapter gives the example of a campaign by Charles Grassley, Grassley of Iowa, who gathered a multi-million dollar war chest, and then he showered the state with TV ads where he's just one of us back home, and he's riding his tractor lawnmower in concentric ellipse, and just showing the people back home that he's just like them with his tractor lawnmower. And also, he has the most beautiful lawn, you know, it's just a beautiful picture. There's this ma marvelous red barn in the back garden, and there is Grassley, you know, and you see this beautiful grass emerging. Okay. So almost no one wants a democracy where le elections are bought in this way. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to skip the next two slides. This show, these are slides about the 19th century before we had regulation. Um, and then I take you to something meatier. OK. So this takes us um, to the first major chapter of the book. So as we all know, probably everybody here recognizes this person. Susie Mormon is a popular TV figure. And as we all know, if we've ever watched her for more than a few seconds, she gives very loud and shrill financial advice. But her audience seems to adore her and lap up every word. So when I asked an economist friend of mine at the IMF about her, he, uh, he had the prediction, predicted reaction. He had watched her for only 10 seconds, and he simply could not stand her mommy knows best voice. Furthermore, he found her investment advice simplistic, which I don't know how he managed it in his 10 seconds, but I think he did. But that does not explain that does not explain why Susie Orman's audiences lap her up. Her most popular book is called The Nine Steps to Financial Freedom, Practical and Spiritual Steps So You Can Stop Worrying. So let's contrast what she says, tells us there with the portrait given of consumer spending in the economics textbooks. So according to economics textbooks, we decide on our demand for the proverbial apples and oranges by having a budget for our spending. And then we choose the combination of apples and oranges along there 
that will maximize our happiness, that maximize our utility. But Susie Orman's financial advice books tells us that consumers do not follow such a textbook protocol in their purchases. So how could consumers do anything better than what the textbooks describe? Well, I'm an economist. You know, I couldn't imagine not doing that. I think when I do go to the supermarket, I, I do that stupid thing that I'm told to do in the textbook. Um, but she tells us that people actually do something different because people have emotional hang-ups with regard to money and with regard to spending it. So what she found as a financial advisor is that they're not honest with themselves. And as a consequence, they do not engage in rational budget. Well, how could she know? Well, as a financial advisor, she had a test. She asked her advisees to add up their expenditures, and those expenditures all but invariably fell short of what a documented accounting from the records later turned up. So for, figuratively, what were people doing? So relative to the proverbial trip to the supermarket to buy those apples and oranges, it's as if her advisees spend too much in the fruit section, and by the time they reach dairy products, there's nothing left over for eggs and milk. Um, so in real life, such budgetary failure translates into having nothing left over for savings. So this failure, this failure to deal cognitively and emotionally with money, says Orman, leads to those unpaid bills. So it's her mission to keep those bills down so that her readers and her clients will no longer worry at night. So that's the role of mommy, and also why those audiences excuse that mommy knows best. Um, so it's worth noting, and this is more than parenthetical, that worries, as noted in Orman's subtitle, are central concerns of the financial advice books, but you will never find that in the index of an economics textbook. Okay? So we don't just need to take Orman's word for it. We can put together a statistical story, and that indicates that a very significant fraction of consumers are worried about how they're going to make ends meet. So a paper by Anna Maria Lasardi asked the question, how confident are you that you could come up with $2,000 if an expected need arose within the next month? So almost 50% of US respondents replied either that they could not or they probably could not come up with the needed $2,000, even though they were being given a whole month to do so. Um, the same difficulties regarding finances can be gleaned from a survey of consumer finances. In 2004, a rough accounting index indicates an average of about $10,000 of financial assets held by the bottom 50th uh, percentile of the population, and most of those financial assets were then illiquid in some way or other. For British workers paid once a month, their expenditures are down a remarkable 20% in, in the week before their next paycheck. And then we have the number of uh, bankruptcies. By my estimate, there, there is something like a 20% chance that someone in the United States will go bankrupt over the course of their lifetime. And there's a sociologist at Harvard who has estimated for Milwaukee the chance of being evicted over a, um, over, per, per year for, by the, for the whole population of Milwaukee, and he finds that to be 2.5%, which is really amazing. Actually, I believe he's made an overestimate. But even if it's half that, it's still an amazing thing to have 1.5% that you're going to be a poor person out on the street, 1.5% per year. That means over a 10-year period, you're going to have 15% of the whole population of Milwaukee. So I'm, I'm doing half of his number. Um, and 15% of the population is going to have that terrible thing happen to them. OK, so this poses a problem, a theoretical puzzle. The Susie Orman view of the world suggests that people are spending too much, and they're worried as a result. So that leaves the question, why? So there's another perspective on this. So back in 1930, John Maynard Keynes wrote a short essay on what life would be like for our grandchildren 100 years later. In one respect, Keynes was totally correct. He predicted that real income would be some eight times higher. So far, income has increased six times, and he's right on target for 2030. But in another respect, Keynes was 
totally off the mark. He did not predict that the grandchildren would be going to bed worried about their next shilling. Instead, he said they would be worried about how to use their surfeit of leisure. I see everybody in this room and their respective spouses worried about their surfeit of leisure. Um, so he failed to predict the housewife who was exhausted from the first and then from the second shift. But the perspective of our book, coupled with listening to Susie Orman, gives us the reason for this. So what's the answer to the puzzle? Well, we know the answer to the puzzle. It's there in this general equilibrium theory. So, you know, in some sense, what we think we're doing in this book, I, I always thought general equilibrium theory was rather dull and, and boring. But, in, but for me, the, the writing this book has brought general equilibrium theory to life. So in the United States, the goal of almost every business person is to get you to spend your money. So life in a capitalist economy is a continual contemptation. So think about it. Just walk down a city street. So walk down Connecticut Avenue. The shop windows are literally there to make you come in and buy. So an example comes from the old days. So in the US, in the old days, I'm old enough to remember the pet shops used to have puppies in the window. And you were supposed to see those puppies, and you were supposed to come in and buy. They were so cute. And so there's even a popular song about it. So Patty Page, the singer, coming down the street, sees such a puppy, and so she bursts into song. So she say, sings, how much is that dog in the window? The one with the waggly tail. How much is that doggy in the window? Arf, arf. I do hope that doggy's for sale. Well, you're not going to buy the book because of my singing. OK. But, but the remarkable thing about that song, so you know, that song is about the fact that they're they have that doggy in the window, and they're going to entice you to sale. Now, the remarkable thing that I didn't realize, actually probably until after the book was written, was that the, the rest of the song fits the, our book just totally magnificently. Because our book is about the two sides of markets. They're wonderful. They give us what we want. It's really, truly, truly, truly tremendously amazing that all of the luxuries that markets give us and that they've developed just in the last 150 years. But then they, there's this bad side to markets. So let me tell you about the subsequent verses. So in the subsequent verse, she says, I'm going to take a trip to California and leave my poor sweetheart alone. If he is a doggy, he won't be loathsome, and the doggy will have a good home. And then she goes on. She continues with her song. It's a very nice song. OK, well, now think about it, OK? The, we, the interesting thing about this song is that it has this ambiguity to it. On the one hand, this may be the most lovely young woman in the world. And she has to go to California. And there she has this wonderful love affair with this boyfriend. And she's going to buy the doggy. And every time the, uh, the, the boyfriend sees the doggy, he's, he has a memory of this wonderful love affair he has with this wonderful woman. OK, so that's story one. But there's also the other side to the story. Here's a scattered grade woman. She's leaving this guy. It's been a disastrous affair. He goes off to California, and there and there she is left with this doggy. And this poor guy, he doesn't know what to do with the darn thing. He has to walk it. He has to take care of it. And every time he sees the doggy wags its tail, he's reminded of this failed love affair. So there you are. But that's the point of the song, is that markets have these two sides. And that's the point of our book. OK, so that's the first message. So in the shopping mall, in the supermarket, temptation is there. These invitations, these attempts to lure us, are simply pervasive. So they're there when we rent an apartment, when we buy a car, uh, when we buy a house, every time we use our, our credit card. So the idea of tempting the consumer to buy, to spend her money, is at the heart of free market capitalism. Um, OK, so that's the first story. Let me give you a second story. Um, so that's endemic temptation. I'll talk about the financial crisis. Let me see. I'm doing OK for time. Uh, so there are hundreds of books on the financial crisis. The typical one is 500 pages long. 
And a typical one, as I'm sure everybody here knows, tells the story of my institution. For example, it's about Lehman or Goldman Sachs or Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or the Fed, or Treasury, or Bank of America, or Citicorp. And they go on and on and on, on forever. And they're also very good, OK? Well, the best ones are very good. Implicit in each of these is that my institution is central to the crisis. Now, the aim of our chapter on the financial crisis, we have three chapters, which give us a, a different feeling for what financial markets are all about. The aim of our chapters on the financial crisis is to do the opposite. So on the, the financial crisis, it's to tell the story of the crisis in general terms. So scratch any economist, and we will go into economic speak. So we're trained to think in terms like supply and demand. And this means that we often ask very good questions, and then we have good analyses of problems. So fishing for fools, it's an offshoot. It's an offshoot from how we standard economists typically do our analysis. But it's not so standard, it's not so standard that every economist was asking the right questions in the buildup to the crisis. But we should have been, because fishing for fools gives us an extremely succinct explanation for what happened, and let me give you one rendition for that. Okay, so, a reputation mod. If I have a reputation, if I have a reputation for selling perfect, beautiful avocados, I have an opportunity. I can sell you a rotten avocado at the price you would pay for the perfect ripe one. I will have mined my reputation, but I will have also fished you for a fool. So there we have, we have the avocados. So such a story lies at the heart of the continuing financial crisis that dominates the economics of our times. The reputation mining in question involved the subversion of the system for rating fixed income securities. So the reputations of the ratings agencies, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, had been built up over the course of almost a century. Their job was to rate bonds on their probability of default. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the ratings agencies took on themselves the task not just of rating bonds, but of also rating more complex derivative securities. The complexity of the payment structures made them somewhat hard to rate, but something else made rating all but impossible. The underlying assets, such as mortgages, were all but inaccessible to the, to the raters. But the public, the public out there would believe whatever ratings were given to them by the agencies. And then industry then grew up an industry grew up to do a reputation mod. So by analogy, by analogy, rotten avocados were being labeled perfect, and with that label, they commanded premium prices, and so what happened was a whole central valley full of growers went into the profitable business of producing such avocados. So this mining of the ratings is the basic story. That's the basic story of the financial crisis. Well, that's not all of the story, as you all know. Uh, it's not all of the explanation. So we must also explain why the production and sale of those overrated securities brought down the financial system. And the answer, again, is simple. The value of these securities reflected these ratings. So that enabled commercial banks and investment banks and also hedge funds to borrow huge amounts of money short term invest in the overrated securities, and pocket small profits from the interest spread on every dollar of investment. They took on a lot of leverage. So that borrowing was made with the rotten securities as collateral. For the moment, they seemed as good as gold. The ratings indicated that there was almost no chance of default. But then, as we all know, the truth was discovered. Those avocados, perfect as they were on the outside, were really rotten on the inside. So we're much less, worth much less than the bankers and finance managers that paid for them. And so from Frankfurt to New York to Reykjavik, financial institutions owed much more than they owned. Without bailout, they were bankrupt. So the chapter then gives the historical answer to four questions. One, how had the ratings agencies initially established their reputation? What then changed making it more profitable to mine that reputation than to keep it? 
Why were the buyers in those rotten ash securities so naive? And then why was the financial system so vulnerable to the discovery that the assets were rotten? So now I've given you sort of two sort of detailed examples of the type of thing that you're going to find in each and every chapter of Fishing for Fools. And so um, th these, are the, these are the chapters. The chapter on advertising cards, houses with credit cards, on lobbying, on food and drugs, inventions, tobacco and alcohol. There's much more on the financial system that I think gives us, a, that I think gives a much better picture than you get from the textbook about how the financial system works. Uh, we talk about protections against fishing for fools, why in fact our lives are actually quite tolerable despite this, and then there's a conclusion and where this fits into economics. Okay, so now let me talk about, make some concluding remarks. So what I've described here is I've described the beginning of the book. In the second half, the book introduces a new concept gives a picture, perhaps not totally general, regarding why and how we are fished for fools. Again, it has to do with being human. Now, this is something that, for the most part, we don't see in economics and we don't see in current economic uh, methodology. Again, this has to do with being human. So we're constantly telling ourselves a story regarding what we do and who we are. So think about yourselves right now and here in this room. Each and every one of you who are sitting in their seats and me who's giving this talk, we have a story. We have a story which is telling us what we're doing. And then we act accordingly. And we, do, we play our roles, we do our parts. Um, so telling ourselves a story is basic to how we think and it's basic to what we, uh, what we do. Psycholo psychologists have different names for these stories. They call them such things as metal frames or scripts or narratives. But then it's in the nature of the stories that they can have uh, graphs or new offshoots. So that's the result of all advertising. So what's the role of, what do advertisers try to do? Uh, the role of advertising is to graph, get, is to graph the advertiser's story onto the story that people are already telling themselves. So you're watching, so that's the story of the doggy in the window. The girl's walking down the street and that advertisement, that doggy, which is waggly tail, attracts the girl's attention and then she bursts into a new story and she's gonna buy the doggy and give it to her boyfriend. But that's in fact a metaphor for what huge amounts of economic activity is. We always want to, we want to attract people to do what we want them to do and to notice what they do. Now such stories play a very important role in people's uh, motivations. And so that concept then pervades the second half of the book regarding advertising, buying a car, lobbying, the fishing uh, by the pharmaceuticals, tobacco and alcohol, and financial markets as well. So let me give you one example of that. So in the chapter on tobacco and alcohol, this message is especially clear. So everybody here knows about the Surgeon General's report. I doubt that many of us have actually sat down and read it, read it although it's actually a very well-written document. And we also know something about the subsequent anti-tobacco. Now that's been successful for the following reason. What did the Surgeon General's report do? It propagated a story, and that story it can be said in three words. That story is, smoking is stupid. Now, almost everybody in the, that we know believes now that smoking is stupid. Even most smokers, 67% of all smokers, know they want to say they want to quit. So that's what it did. Regarding alcohol, whose harms are quite possible, also very large, the fact is we don't know. There is no such story. And there's virtually no movement even to do research to evaluate those harms. So there is a dual, there's a dual career for tobacco, which has somewhat been brought under control. It's still a very serious danger. But we don't even know what, 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 how much the harms are that are due to alcohol. All we know is we, we have occasional anecdotes about that. And as an indicator of that, the taxes on alcohol are very low. For example, the federal tax on a bottle of wine is 21 cents, and the, Massachusetts, the, the Massachusetts state tax 
on a can of beer is only one cent. So I hope I'm right about that. I've looked it up five times, so I'm probably right. Okay. So what does this? So this takes us to a final message, of the book, about. Uh, about the role in economics. Economics tends to disregard the role of sto stories. Now, we saw that in the Susie Orman example. Standard textbook just assumes that people maximize their utility subject to their budget constraint. They do that textbooky thing. But that does not capture what Tim and Sue really are thinking in the supermarket when they're choosing their apples and oranges so they're broke at the end of the month. So as economists, we have a duty to go out and ask. And this is a duty that we haven't been taking on ourselves. What are people really thinking when they make their decisions? The role of stories, which takes center stage in the second half of Fishing for Fools, is then its second important message. And then the concluding chapter then, appropriately, I think, is about how a wrong national story in the United States is about the unambiguous benefits of free markets and how that's led to dysfunctional national policy. So the chapter gives three examples of this wrong national policy regarding Social Security, regarding budgets for the SEC, and regarding campaign re uh, finance reform. Um, but of course, the whole book is about, just to repeat, is about how economics is about telling the right stories. And those stories are very important. And they tend to be a very important thing that's left out of most of our economic analysis. And it's, it's also left out of the, math, of, of the mathematical models that political science has tell about politics, although politics is really super about that. OK, so thank you. Put it over here. Thank you. Okay, well, George, that was terrific. Uh, we're now going to open up the discussion to questions. Please identify yourself and try to keep your questions relatively short. Uh, to get the ball rolling, let me use the prerogative of the chair to ask an opening question. In the book, you talk about resistance to fishing and its heroes. And I was hoping that I could get your reaction to two resistance organizations, one from the private sector and one from the public sector. The first one is firms like Angie's List, which for a modest fee provide reviews on local service providers. So if you want to get your driveway paved or you want to get a plumber, you just type in the service that you want and you get the reviews rated by the customers. Very detailed, the cost, nature of the job, uh, how promptly they responded, the quality of the work. And for the bigger, for some of the firms that are using most, you might have 25 or 50 reviews and uh, most of them are in the past six months. So if someone's trying to fish me, I have an unscrupulous provider, uh, it's going to be harder for them to mine uh, their reputation because as soon as they do that, they get negative reviews and other people read about it and they lose their business. So the, the general question I'm asking about that is, well, if there are these things that are going on, uh, in a way there's money on the table for someone to do anti-fishing. Why isn't it possible then for, uh, for those businesses, they're, they're for-profit businesses, to, to do that and offset the effects of fishing? The yeah, other one I was wondering. wondering the answer yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. okay, that's a very good question. Okay, so I guess part of our, there is a chapter about why uh, 
about institutions that have grown up. I like the, your example of Angie's List. Um, do I worry about Angie's List? Yeah, I sort of do worry about Angie's List because I, I use Angie's List and then I feel sorry for all of those other people who are down the list who may be just, who, who may, who are probably quite good. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, these things, so there can, there's all kinds of reputation uh, inf uh, institution which, which help us against Angie's List. Our exam, which help us like Angie's List. Our example was the Better Business Bureau, but I think you've actually come up with, with a better example. A better example, but then, there, then there's the problem. Um, but then there are problems for which an Angie's List just simply isn't going to uh, help us. And that is the Angie's List person comes and they convince you that you really need a repair that you actually didn't need and you, you go away, you think you're perfectly happy. So that's, so we talk about people who are emotional fools and there's, there's very little, def there's very little, there's much less, you don't get defense from being an emotional fool by Angie's List, just an informational fool. Okay, the other example is the Consumer Financial Protection Agency, which addresses many of the things about credit cards and mortgages that you talk yep. about. But again, that is about informational phishing, yep. not emotional phishing. So anyway, uh, let's open it up. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm Swami Ayer of the Cato Institute. You know, it's easy to say that the markets are imperfect. Yeah. But the human beings are imperfect. Yeah. If markets are supposed to deal with human beings as they are, then blaming the imperfection of the humans on the markets, I think, gets the things slightly wrong. I mean, let's get to a non-market area like politics. Mm -hmm. In politics, are people fishing for fools? Absolutely. Every single politician okay. is fishing for fools. I would include religion. Every religion, in my view, is fishing for fools. You're, you are reaching out and getting for all those guys. So you don't have to be in part of the market to be fishing for fools. Fishing for fools is inbuilt into all human behavior. If you want to say something significant, you have to show me what it is, which makes this market thing different from fishing for fools in areas like politics, uh, customs, uh, choice of color of your wife, I mean, a, a thousand areas uh, where you'll find there's similar kinds of fishing, and it has to do with the imperfection of human beings rather than markets. Okay, so I disagree with that 100% with your question. Um, there is a view regarding economics, and it's a correct view that markets give us a very good, and they give us a something that would be called optimality. You say, um, what we have said is that this view of markets, which is held by almost all economists under the appropriate conditions, we say that there is a further theorem and in which markets don't just have their good side, markets also have their bad side. Now, I agree with you. I think there's fishing everywhere. So I'll give you an example. I, I, I hope I can do this well. So I'll give you an example where this occurs in, in religion, you know? Here we are, we got the fish for fools. So my view is that all of this occurs because we're human and this is part of what we're going, and it goes way beyond. And so it goes way beyond. Now I give you, you mentioned politics. Okay, so I think I actually have read, but I may not have done a sufficiently careful job, of the, the political science models of voting behavior and so forth. Um, they're okay. What they talk about is they talk about informed versus uninformed voters. But if you read the book, I think we actually give a picture of that which is much closer to reality because we, so we, we take the Downs model, but then we show that in fact when you take the Downs model, you get something that actually gives you, I think, something closer to, uh, to reality, and I think it gives us a, a better picture of what the politics are. And then what we say there, and this is what happens in crescendo throughout the whole book, and the latter half of the book, is that it all has to do with what, what are politicians trying to do. They're trying to tell their story. 
So Grassley out there with this lawnmower saying, Grassley, Grassley, I like to come home to Iowa and mow my lawn just like the other, all you folks. They're telling a story about who he is. So, you know, I feel all of this, a lot of, large part of this book is how people are motivated by stories, and I think that's what you were telling me. And, and we have these stories, sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong, and um, that's what being human is all about. So this is talking about um, how this aspect of our being human I've taught, affects markets and our view of markets, but of course it affects everything else. So I agree with you 100% that it affects everything else. I disagree with you 100% that ta applying this to our theory of markets is inappropriate. Okay, so that's my answer. Do you want to say more? Or? Oh, good, thank you. As a book, I mean, I think that human beings themselves are first. Yeah, right. So, I mean, okay, yeah. you said that applies. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you said, for instance, that something should be a no-brainer. Yeah. That, you know, regarding personal financial insecurity, financial uh, macro yeah. instability, ill health, bad government. Yeah. All the communists and socialists said, this is, capitalism gives you these four bad things, therefore you should go for communism or you should go for for socialism. Okay. So in other words, so we you, left out the chapter no. on we had a chapter on socialism, yeah. and that may or may not come out in, in 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 an economics journal. I mean, the worst story ever, okay, was the story that the Bolsheviks told, and you know, it just makes it, it makes me angry every time I think about it. Okay, but the thing is, we weren't talking about why we're not in nineteen. Um, 17, and I wasn't telling you why, why we didn't have the Russian Revolution. Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Colin Hendricks. I'm here with the Peterson Institute. Yeah. I'm interested uh, in the extent to which there's a theory of, of preference formation in the book, and, and I'll illustrate what I'm, what I'm confused about with an example. So if we decide that there is a person who lives here in the district in a small apartment, who lives in a very kind of confined urban area, and they decide that they want a full-size pickup. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know why they want the full-size pickup, but they go around and they shop Dodge, they shop yep. Chevrolet, GMC, yep. Ford. They get the best price possible for that full-size pickup. Have they been fished? Yeah. They have. Oh, no, no, no I, I, I'm not telling you whether they have or not. The point is, the wonderful thing about general equilibrium theory is it holds no matter over all utility functions and over all production functions up to, you know, up to certain specification. Our theory is we don't need to tell you for this that uh, exactly what people's specification. We don't need to tell you that when they are, but we will know that they can, that you can be fished for fools. So if the people have this weakness, then in fact, the market's going to be there. So the book begins um, with a vignette about uh, Molly. Uh, Molly is, a, um, is an addicted gambler in Las Vegas. And so there is a clear example of somebody who's been fished for fools. She, and not only has she been fished for fools, the amazing thing about Molly is Molly knows it herself. She knows, she doesn't go to the gambling casino to, to win, she goes because she knows she's addicted and then she's going to push that red button and she's going to keep pushing it until she's out of money and then she has to leave and this is making her life an utter hell. So the fact is, the fact is we don't need, we, we're, we're giving examples in the book examples where it's unambiguous about being fish for fools. So maybe your couple, I think the way you describe it, I think you think the couple was fish for a fool. Huh. My view is, yeah, probably, but, uh, but maybe not. Yes. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I'm Mark Tokola from the Korea Economic Institute. Yeah. Now, outside the room, there's a table with a very attractive set of books on it, with a very attractive cover, yeah, written by a justly renowned economist. Yeah. I'm tempted to part with my money to buy that book, but how can I tell if I'm making a rational choice or if I'm giving to my book addiction? Yeah. Okay, so 
so yeah, I think this is an answer to your question too. So I, th so Molly, when Molly goes to the sl slots, when she's off the slot, she knows that this is her pr problem. She goes to Gambling Anonymous, she takes medication for it. Um, so I think one way to, to, to know that you're, be that you're being fished for fools is when you put yourself in your quiet, rational state of mind, you can say to yourself, I shouldn't have done that. And you can say, I was in a bad moment when, when I did that. So, so that's a way in which, so I think all of the major examples in the book, the people would say, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Now the other thing is that there are all kinds of market mechanisms. There's information um, fishing of various sorts. And we, t we talk about the information fishing with respect to the, to the marketing of Vioxx. And there, of course, the people would automatically say that they've been fished for fools. So Vioxx, you had a, just a huge increase in your chance of having a stroke when you took Vioxx. Uh -huh. There was a book called, about the same time that Patty Page sang about that doggy, there was a book called Hidden Persuaders. Uh -huh. I wonder what we've learned since then. Okay, so yeah, so actually Hidden Persuaders, Bob and I both read it when we were teenagers. And um, Hidden Persuaders, at least by its title, it indicated that it was hidden persuasion. Here, this stuff is all out in the in the open, Molly knows she's going and she's pushing this button. So the thing is, what, what's new to this book is, is bringing it into economics. So it's uniting the economics and the psychology, that this is an equilibrium. So what's the major message to this book? The major message of the book is that if something like Cinnabon can make a profit on selling you on, this, um, on those Cinnabons that are going to get you to uh, to trash your diet, that it's going to be there. So this is an economics book. You read the book, and each and every chapter has something economics in it. So it's a very different, Hidden Persuaders is a good book. So this is what Bob and I both remember about it. Um, we remember that housewives, that uh, cake mixes uh, required that you add an egg. You remember that one? Yeah, okay, so you, and the reason was that the uh, housewives who were then making uh, cakes wanted to feel that they were adding something to the product, and so it was their product. Pumpkin stones were being sold, but that pumpkin. Oh yes, I remember that one, <laughs> yes, right. So, but, but this is actually quite a different book, and it's different for the reason Danny said. Danny said, psychology is about how we're fallible machines, ours is about well, how we're fallible machines, and then there's an equilibrium. And so the equilibrium is, is the cut point. And then that's in answer to, to your question, is the equilibrium and the fact that we get this thing at an equilibrium that is the cut point. And that's, where, and that's why we have an equilibrium where the financial markets fail. So, so another advertisement, I'll give you another advertisement for the book. I think we give a different, different view of financial markets. So there are three chapters on financial markets. I think we give a different view of financial markets than you learn from financial textbooks. And it gives, I think it gives you this picture of the financial markets that they're not only are they the place where um, you have all this nice intermediation, which is probably necessary, but it's also a form of gambling casino and that that has this. And I don't think, it's not so easy to find that actually written in books on economics. Okay. Any others? Thanks. Yes. My name is uh, Peter Harry Wu, mm. and I'm the director of the Log Eye Research Foundation. I, very, I was very strange. I got an invitation from Adam Posner mm -hmm. to come to this uh, meeting. I think you never know about me. I never heard about you, too. And 
I have no connection with any economic issue at all. Uh -huh. I was in China 19 years in the labor camps. Mm -hmm. So I come here mostly talking about human rights issue. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why they got an invitation to come to this meeting. Uh -huh. But I want to say in China, minimum three million prisoners mm -hmm. and all of them that workers, mm -hmm. okay? It's a huge system, economic systems. And one of the camps, I can give you the size, 162 square kilometers, mm -hmm. two times Washington DC area. Mm -hmm. Big, huge. Mm -hmm. China have a huge labor camp systems. Yeah. And at the beginning, 1950, 1949, the Soviet expert helped the Chinese to build it. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I met. Excuse me, I, I don't want to prep you, but do you have a, a question for Sir? Professor Akerlof about the book or about economics? Or are you? I'm sorry, I got an invitation yeah, sure. to come uh, to this meeting. That's why I don't know why. I feel very strange. I told you. Yeah. That is my situation. Why I came over here? Uh, well, I, I, pre I appreciate that, but I think. We need to keep the... Okay, so let me, let me give an answer okay. to this. I do have an answer. Okay. So, look. If you don't like, okay. next time, don't send me the invitation. No, no, I, I'm happy. I, I like your question, and I'm very happy you're here. No. Um, to, uh, okay, can, can you just maybe just finish a little bit so I can know your uh, question? My name is William Yeah, and, and, and the question was, aren't we being... A, okay, so I, I, let, me, let me continue. So... Thank you, thank you. Um, so I think that this book has relevance for China too. So, you know, look, I don't want, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say anything. I, I think these labor camps are really, really terrible, and of course. But then I also think that, we, that China has to be very careful about going into a market system, it has to know but that there are both good things about the market system and bad things about the market system. And so you can't just be too much of a market system fundamentalist. So I think the major, the major view of this is Bob and I, we start the book and we say there are these wonders of the market system. That's one. But two, at the same time that there's these wonders of the market system, uh, there are these disadvantages. And I think that um, in the United States, and this is a book mainly about the United States, that we're looking at these, these mar the market system with rose-colored glasses. And I feel that that has impeded having good government and good policies. And uh, this is a book which is aimed to show that, that yes, market system is good, but but you know, we all love our children and our spouses and, this, and everything else. But um, there are times when you know, uh, when they, when 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 we they don't do everything that we like. And so we should say the same thing about our market system. We like our market system, so I guess we like our political system. But we should also, if we're going to have a good political system and a good economic system, we also have to know where they don't perform and do exactly what we want. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And I hope that maybe this is relevant also for China. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>